Welcome. Hello, and welcome to our radio drama presentation of Inglorious Bastards. Please note that this script has descriptions of graphic violence and language, so listener discretion is advised. In addition, all dialogue will be read in English, but narration will indicate the language spoken. In addition, in addition, this is a live performance, and the cast has had no rehearsals together, so there may be occasional stumbles in the dialogue. We're expecting to have a lot of fun, and hope you will too. And now, please enjoy Inglorious Bastards. Chapter 1. Once Upon a Time in Nazi-Occupied France 1941. A year into the occupation, a farmer is chopping wood outside his house while two young women do laundry nearby. As one of the girls hangs a sheet to dry, she hears a noise coming from the road nearby. She moves the sheet aside and sees a car with small Nazi flags attached to the hood and two motorcycles driving toward the farm. Papa! Go back inside. Shut the door. Truly, give me some water for my wash-up. Then get inside with your sisters. Don't run. The farmer calmly cleans his face as the others go inside. Within a moment, the vehicles are parked on the side of the road, and a man in, a, uh, in an officer's uniform climbs out of the car. He approaches the farmer, and the two speak in French. Is this the property of Perrier La Petite? I am Perrier La Petite. It is a pleasure to meet you, Monsieur Lapidit. I am Colonel Hans Lander of the SS. What can I do for you? I was hoping you could invite me inside your home and we may have a discussion. Certainly. After you. Colonel Landa is brought inside and is greeted by three women standing together in the kitchen. Colonel Landa, this is my family. Colonel Hans Lander of the SS, madam, at your service. Monsieur Lapidite, the rumors I have heard in the village about your family are all true. Each one of your daughters is more lovely than the last. Merci. Please have a seat. Suzanne, would you be so good as to get the colonel some wine? But no, merci beaucoup, but no wine. This being a dairy farm, one would be safe in assuming you have milk? Oui. Then milk is what I prefer. Very well. She takes a carafe of milk out of the icebox and pours a glass for the colonel, who drinks it all in one go. Monsieur, to both your family and your cows, I say bravo. Merci. Please, join me at your table. Very well. Monsieur Lapidite, what we have to discuss would be better discussed in private. You'll notice I left my men outdoors. If it wouldn't offend them, could you ask your lovely ladies to step outside? You're right. Charlotte, would you take the girls outside? The colonel and I have a few things of words. The girls quietly exit. Monsieur Lapidite, I regret to inform you I've exhausted the extent of my French. To continue to speak it so inadequately would only serve to embarrass me. However, I've been led to believe you speak English quite well. Oui. Well, it just so happens I do as well. This being your house, I ask your permission to switch to English for the remainder of our conversation. By all means. The two switch from French to English. While I'm very familiar with you and your family, I have no way of knowing if you are familiar with who I am. Are you aware of my existence? Yes. This is good. Are you aware of the job I have been ordered to carry out in France? Yes. Please, tell me what you've heard. I've heard the Führer has put you in charge of rounding up the Jews left in France, who are either hiding or passing for a Gentile. The Führer couldn't have said it better himself. But the meaning of your visit, pleasant though it is, is mysterious to me. The Germans looked through my house nine months ago for hiding Jews and 
found nothing. Mm, I'm aware of that. I read the reports on this area. But like any enterprise, when under new management, there's always a slight duplication of efforts. Most of it being a complete waste of time, but needs to be done nevertheless. I just have a few questions, Monsieur Lapidite. If you can assist me with answers, my department can close a file on your family. The colonel puts his black leather touch case on the table and takes out a folder and expensive fountain pen. Now, before the occupation, there were four Jewish families in this area, all dairy farmers like yourself. The Dolarok, the Rolin, the Lovit, and the Dreyfuses. Is that correct? To my knowledge, those were the Jewish families among the dairy farmers. Uh, Herr Colonel, would it disturb you if I smoke my pipe? Oh, please, Monsieur Lapidite, this is your house. Make yourself comfortable. The farmer gets a small wooden box, removes a simple pipe, and sets a match to it. Now, according to these papers, all the Jewish families in this area have been accounted for except, uh, Dreyfus's. Somewhere in the last year, it would appear they have vanished. Which leads me to the conclusion that they've either made good their escape or someone is very successfully hiding them. What have you heard about the Dreyfuses, Monsieur Lapidite? Only rumors. Oh, I love rumors. Facts can be so misleading where rumors, true or false, are often revealing. So, Monsieur Lapidite, what rumors have you heard regarding the Dreyfuses? Again, this is just a rumor. But uh, we heard the Dreyfuses had made their way into Spain. So the rumors you've heard have been of escape? Yes. Mm. Having never met the Dreyfuses, could you confirm for me the exact members of the household and their names? There were five of them. The father, Jacob, wife, Miriam, and her brother, Bob. How old is Bob? Thirty, thirty-one. Hmm. Continue. And the children, Amos and Shoshana. Ages of the children? Uh... Uh, Amos was, uh, nine or ten. And Shoshana? Uh, and Shoshana was 18 or 19, I'm not really sure. Under the floorboards, the Dreyfus family breathes as quietly as possible. Well, I guess that should do it. However, before I go, could I have another glass of your delicious milk? But of course. Monsieur Lapidite, are you aware of the nickname the people of France have given me? I have no interest in such things. But you're aware of what they call me? I am aware. What are you aware of? That they call you the Jew Hunter. Precisely. I understand your trepidation in repeating it. Heidrich apparently hates the moniker the good people of Prague have bestowed on him. Actually, why he would hate the name the Hangman is baffling to me. It would appear he's done everything in his power to earn it. But I, on the other hand, love my unofficial title. Precisely because I've earned it. The feature that makes me such an effective hunter of the Jews is, as opposed to most German soldiers, I can think like a Jew, where they can only think like a German, or more precisely, a German soldier. Now, if one to de were to determine what attribute the German people share with the beast, it would be the cunning and the predatory instinct of a hawk. But if one were to determine what attributes the Jews share with the beast, it would be that of a rat. The Fuhrer and Goebbels propaganda have pretty much said the same thing, but where our conclusions differ is I don't consider the comparison an insult. 
Consider for a moment the world a rat lives in. It's a hostile world indeed. If a rat were to scamper through your front door right now, would you greet it with hostility? I suppose I would. Has a rat ever done anything to you to create this animosity you feel toward them? Rats spread disease. They bite people. Rats were the cause of the bubonic plague, but that was some time ago. I propose to you any disease a rat could spread, a squirrel could equally carry. Would you agree? We. Oui. And I assume you don't same, share the same animosity with squirrels that you do with rats, do you? No. Yet they're both rodents, are they not? And except for the tail, they even rather look alike, don't they? It is an interesting thought there, Colonel. Ah, however interesting as the thought may be, it makes not one bit of difference as to how you feel. If a rat were to walk in here right now as I'm talking, would you greet it with the source of your delicious milk? Probably not. I didn't think so. You don't like them. You don't really know why you don't like them. All you know is you find them repulsive. Consequently, the German soldier conducts a search of a house suspected of hiding Jews. Where does the hawk look? He looks in the barn, he looks in the attic, he looks in the cellar. He looks everywhere he would hide. But there are so many places it would never occur to a hawk to hide. However, the reason the Fuhrer has brought me off my Alps in Austria and placed me in French cow country today is because it does occur to me. Because I'm aware of what tremendous feats human beings are capable of once they abandon dignity. May I smoke my pipe as well? Please, sir, Colonel. Make yourself at home. The Jew hunter pulls out a large Sherlockian calabash pipe and lights it. Now, my job dictates that I must have my men enter your home and conduct a thorough search before I can officially cross your family's name off my list. And if there are any irregularities to be found, rest assured there will be. That is unless you have something to tell me that makes a conducting of a search unnecessary. I might also add that any information that makes the performance of my duty easier will not be met with punishment. Actually, quite the contrary. It will be met with reward. And that reward will be your family will cease to be harassed in any way by the German military during the rest of our occupation of your country. The farmer, humble pipe in mouth, stares across the table at his German visitor. There is a pause. You are sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? It's... You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? Yes. Point out to me the areas where they are hiding. He quietly gestures to an area near them. Landa stands above the area and gestures down with his pipe. Lapadip nods. Since I haven't heard any disturbance, I assume that while they're listening, they don't speak English? Yes. I'm going to switch back to French now, and I want you to follow my masquerade. Is that clear? Yes. Monsieur Lapadite, I thank you for your milk and your hospitality. I do believe our business here is done. He opens the front door. Ah, ladies. Three Nazi soldiers enter. Landa points to the floor, and they aim their rifles. I thank you for your time. We shan't be bothering your family any longer. So, monsieur, mademoiselle, I bid farewell to you and say adieu. The soldiers open fire. The wooden floor is riddled with holes, and the small farmhouse is filled with smoke, dust, and a little blood. Landa waves his hand, and the soldiers cut off their gunfire. After a momentary pause, he sees movement under the floorboards. It's the girl. A young woman covered in blood pushes her way out from under the house and sprints toward the cover of nearby woods. Londa steps outside and draws his pistol, aiming at her. He pauses and watches his prey fleeing for her life. After holding his aim for several seconds, he smiles and lowers his weapon. 
Au revoir, Shoshana! Chapter 2, Inglorious Bastards. Somewhere in England, a group of soldiers line up at attention as their commanding officer addresses them. My name is Lieutenant Aldo Rain, and I'm putting together a special team. And I need me eight soldiers. Eight Jewish American soldiers. Now, y'all might have heard rumors about the Armada happening soon. Well, we'll be leaving a little earlier. We're going to be dropped into France dressed as civilians. And once we're in enemy territory, as a bushwhacking guerrilla army, we're going to be doing one thing and one thing only. Killing Nazis. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I sure as hell didn't come down from the goddamn Smoky Mountains, cross 5,000 miles of water, fight my way through half of Sicily, and jump out of a fucking aeroplane to teach the Nazis lessons in humanity. Nazi ain't got no humanity. They're the foot soldiers of a Jew-hating, mass-murdering maniac, and they need to be destroyed. That's why any and every son of a bitch we find wearing a Nazi uniform, they're gonna die. Now, I am the direct descendant of the mountain man Jim Bridger. That means I got a little Indian in me. And our battle plan will be that of the Apache resistance. We will be cruel to the Germans. And through our cruelty, they will know who we are. And they will find the evidence of our cruelty in the disbowment, dismemberment, and disfigured bodies of their brothers we leave behind us. And the Germans won't be able to help themselves, but imagine the cruelty their brothers endured at our hands, and our boot heels, and the edges of our knives. And the German will be sickened by us, and the German will talk about us. And the German will fear us. And when the German closes their eyes at night and their subconscious tortures them for the evil they've done, it will be thoughts of us that tortures them with. Sound good? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's what I like to hear. But I got a word of warning to y'all would-be warriors. When you join my command, you take on a debt. A debt you owe me, personally. Each and every man under my command owes me 100 Nazi scalps. And I want my scalps. And y'all will get me 100 Nazi scalps. Take from the heads of 100 dead Nazis. Or you die trying. A few weeks later in France, the bastards complete, complete what is clearly not their first successful ambush. Several stand guard while others scalp and loot dozens of dead Nazis. Aldo sits in front of an abandoned tunnel and glances over at one of his men who stands behind the only three living Nazis left. The prisoners are on their knees and have their hands behind their heads. Hey, Hirschberg. Send that crap Sarge over. You, go. The Nazi sergeant slowly stands, walks over to Aldo, and politely salutes his captor. Sergeant Werner Hartmann. Then Aldo Rain, pleased to meet you. You know what sit down means, Werner? Yes. And sit down. How's your English, Werner? Because if need be, we got a couple fellers can translate. Wiki there, uh, Austrian Jew, got the fuck out of Munich. Probably getting was good. Became American, got drafted. Come back to give y'all what for. Another one over there you might be familiar with, Sergeant Hugo Stiglitz. You heard of him? Everybody in the German army's heard of Hugo Stiglitz. Now, the reason for Hugo Stieglitz's celebrity among German soldiers is simple. As a German enlisted man, he killed 13 Gestapo officers. 
Instead of putting him up against a wall, the high command decided to send him back to Berlin to be made an example of. <laughs> Needless to say, once the bastards heard about him, he never got there. And I assume you know who we are. Pure Aldo, the Apache. Well, Werner, if you've heard of us, you probably heard we ain't in the prisoner taking business. We in the killing Nazi business. And cousin, business is booming. Now that leaves two ways we can play this out. Either kill you or let you go. Now, whether or not you're going to leave this ditch alive depends entirely on you. Up the road, peace, there's an orchard. Besides, we know there's another crowd patrol fucking around here somewhere. Now, if that patrol were to have any crack shots, that orchard would be a goddamn sniper's delight. Now, if you ever want to eat a, another sauerkraut sandwich again, you gotta show me on this here map where they are, you gotta tell me how many of them there are, and you gotta tell me what kind of artillery they're carrying with them. You can't expect me to divulge information that would put German lives in danger. Well now, Werner, that's where you're wrong, because that's exactly what I expect. I need to know about Germans hiding in trees, and you need to tell me. And you need to tell me right now. Now just take that finger of yours and point on this here map. Where the party's being held, how many's coming, and what they brought to play with them. I respectfully refuse, sir. A clacking sound is heard from inside the nearby tunnel. Hear that? Yes. That's Sergeant Donnie Donowitz. You might know him better by his nickname. The Bear Jew. Now, if you've heard of Aldo the Apache, you gotta heard about the Bear Jew. I heard of the Bear Jew. What'd you hear? He beats German soldiers with a club. He bashes their brains in with a baseball bat, that's what he does. And Werner... I'm going to ask you one last goddamn time. And if you still respectfully refuse, I'm calling the bear to over. And he's going to take that big bat of his and he's going to beat your ass to death with you. Now, take your wiener stitch the licking finger and point on this map what I want to know. Fuck you and your Jew dogs. <laughs> Actually, we're, we're all tickled to hear you say that, because quite frankly, watching Donnie beat Nazis to death is the closest thing we get to go into the movies around here. Donnie! Yeah? We got us a German who wants to die for his country. Oblige him. Werner stares into the tunnel as the clacking sound gets closer. After several tense moments, Donnie appears, tapping his bat against the brick lining of the tunnel as he goes. The muscular soldier walks up to Werner, towering over him. He sees the iron cross hanging from the sergeant's right pocket and taps it with the end of his bat. You got that for killing Jews? Bravery. Donnie nods, his face filled with complex emotions as he lightly places the end of the bat on the side of Werner's head before swinging the power, swinging with the power of a professional baseball player. The bastards cheer as Werner hits the ground and Donnie viciously beats him until he stops moving. Hirschberg talks to the other two Nazis over the cheers. About now, I'd be shitting my pants if I was you. Teddy fucking Williams knocks it out of the park. Fenway Park's on its feet for Teddy fucking ball game. He went yard on that one on the fucking Lansdowne Street. Donnie points at one of the remaining prisoners. You! The Nazi soldier stands and is promptly shot in the back by Hirschberg. Damn it, Hirschberg. Donnie, bring that other one over here. Alive. 
Donnie harshly grabs the last sniveling soldier and walks him over to Aldo. Get the fuck up! Batter up! You're on deck! Two hit! I hit you, you hit the ground! You want to live? Yes, sir. Point out, point out the German position. His arm shoots out like a rocket and points to a cluster of trees in the southern part of the map. How many? About twelve. What kind of artillery? The Nazi gives a detailed description of the artillery and answers every other question Aldo asks without hesitation. Now, when you report what happened here, you can't tell them you told us what you told us. They'll shoot you. But they're going to want to know why you're so special. We let you live. So tell them we let you live so you can spread the word through the ranks what's going to happen to every Nazi we find. Now, say we let you go, and you survive the war. When you get home, what are you going to do? I, I will hug my mother like I've never hugged her before. Well, ain't that nice. Are you going to take off your uniform? Not, not only shall I remove it, but I intend to burn it. Yeah, that's what we thought. We don't like that. See, we like our Nazis in uniform. That way you can spot them, just like that. But, uh, you take that uniform off, ain't nobody gonna know you was a Nazi. And that don't sit well with us. So, I'm gonna give you a little something you can't take off. He pulls out a large hunting knife, and the bastards hold the Nazi down while Aldo delicately carves a swastika into the man's forehead. You know, Lieutenant, you're getting pretty good at that. You know how you get into Carnegie Hall, huh? Practice. Chapter 3. German Night in Paris In Paris, during June 1944, a woman emerges from a cinema, carrying a bucket of marquee letters and a tall ladder. She quietly begins changing the cinema display. It's Shoshana Dreyfus, three years after the murder of her family. As she goes about her chore, a young German soldier walks over to her. Uh, what, what starts tomorrow? A Max Linder festival. Ah, I always preferred Linder to Chaplin. Except Linder never made a film as good as The Kid. The chase climax of The Kid, superb. I, I adore your cinema very much. Merci. Is, is it yours? Do I own it? Oui. Oui. How is it a girl as young as you owns a cinema? My aunt left it to me. Ah, merci for hosting a German night. I don't have a choice, but you're welcome. I love the Reichenstaffel uh, mountain films, especially uh, Piz Palu. It's nice to see a French girl who's an admirer of uh, uh, Reichenstahl. Admire would not be the adjective I would use to describe my feelings toward Fraulein Reichenstahl. But you do admire the director Paps, don't you? That's why you included his name on the marquee when you didn't have to? I'm French. We respect directors in our country. Even Germans? Even Germans. We. Oui. Adieu. You're not finished? I'll finish in the morning. Uh, may I ask your name? You wish to see my papers? She hands him her excellently forged papers. Emmanuel Nimil. It's a very pretty name. Merci. Are you finished with my papers? Indeed, he hands them back. Uh, uh, Mademoiselle, may I introduce myself? Uh, Frederick Zoller. No response. Well, it's been a pleasure chatting with fellow cinema lover. Sweet dreams, Mademoiselle. Uh, adieu. He gives her a little salute and walks into the curfew-imposed night. A few days later, Shoshana is reading a book in the back of a French bistro when Zoller sees her through the window and walks in. Again, they speak together in French. Hello, mademoiselle. May I join you? Look, Frederick. You remember my name? Yes. Look, you seem a pleasant enough fellow. Merci. You're welcome. Regardless, I want you to stop pestering me. I apologize, mademoiselle. I wasn't trying to be a pest. I was simply trying to be friendly. I don't wish to be your friend. Why not? Don't act like an infant. You know why. I'm more than just a uniform. Not to me. If you are so desperate for a friend's girlfriend, I suggest you try Vicky. 
Just then, another German soldier comes over, grinning excitedly at Frederick. The other soldier, whose uniform shows he is of a higher rank, is clearly excited to see Zoller. After a minute of chatting, the officer goes on his way. Shasana's eyes narrow. Who are you? I thought I was just a uniform. You're not just a German soldier. Are you somebody's son? Eh, most German soldiers are somebody's son. Another soldier pokes his head over the divider between bistro booths. After a brief exchange with Zoller, the other man walks over with his wife and excitedly shakes the younger soldier's hand. As Zoller signs a piece of paper, the man's wife turns to Shasana and speaks to her in French. You're a very lucky girl catching a brave war hero. No, 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 no. Uh, the mademoiselle is not my girlfriend. Can you write a more babette? Zoller obliges, and the two excitedly rejoin some friends on the other side of the bistro. So you're a war hero. What did you do? I was alone in the bell tower in a walled off city. It was myself and a thousand rounds of ammo in a bird's nest against 300 enemy soldiers. What's a bird's nest? A bird's nest is what a sniper would call a bell tower. It's a high structure offering a 360 degree view, very advantageous for a marksman. How many did you kill? 68. The first day. 150. The second day. 32. The third day. On the fourth day, they exited the city. Naturally, my war story received a lot of attention in Germany. That's why they all recognize me. They called me the German Sergeant York. Maybe they'll make a film about your exploits. Well, that's just what uh, Joseph Goebbels thought. So he did. It's called Nation's Pride. And they wanted me to play myself. So I did. Uh, Joseph thinks the movie will be proven to be his masterpiece. I will be the German von Johnson. Nation's Pride is about you? Nation's Pride is starring you? No, I know. Comical? Well, good luck with your premiere, Private. I hope all goes well for Joseph and yourself. Au revoir. And with that, she exits the restaurant, leaving the perplexed Private alone. The next day, Shasana... Shash the next day, Shasana is changing the marquee again and speaking with a black gentleman carrying film reels. Do you need help? No, it's okay. If you need me, I'll be in the storage room. Okay, my love. He goes inside, and a minute later, a Nazi sedan pulls up. A German major and the car's driver both step out. Mademoiselle, Miss Mew? Oui? Is this your cinema? Oui? Come down. She climbs down the ladder, and the driver opens the back door of the sedan, indicating for her to get in. I don't understand. What have I done? Get to ass in that car. Shasana gets in. At a high-class restaurant nearby, a group sits around a table. A gentleman in a fine suit sits between a woman wearing a fur coat and Private Zoller. It's only the offspring of slaves that allows America to be competitive athletically. American Olympic gold can be measured in negro sweat. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Goebbels, the number two man in Hitler's Third Reich. Shasana is led through the French eatery by the Gestapo Major. Private Zoller sees her and stands to greet her in French. Ah, oh, good, you came. I, I wasn't sure whether or not you'd accept my invitation. Invitation? Is that the young lady in question, Frederick? Uh, yes, it is, Dr. Gobelt. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, there's someone I would like you to meet. Emmanuel Mimu. I'd like to introduce you to the Minister of Propaganda, the leader of the entire German film industry, and now I'm an actor, uh, my boss, Dr. Joseph Gobelt. Your reputation precedes you, Fraulein Mimio. Gabelz offers up his long, spider-like fingers for Shasana to shake. She does. The doctor looks to the woman at his side to introduce herself as well, but she's just taken a big bite of tiramisu. 
Bonjour. Shasana quickly and correctly infers that she does not much that she does much more than just translate. Bonjour. And you've met the Major. Actually, I didn't introduce myself. Major Dieter Hillstrom of the Gestapo at your service, Mademoiselle. Please allow me. Have a seat. Let's see. And try the champagne, Mademoiselle. It's quite good. I must say, Fraulein, I should be rather annoyed with you. I arrive in France and I wish to have lunch with my star. Little do I know he's become the toast of Paris. And now he must find time for me. People wait in hours, days to see me. For the Führer and for private Zola, I wait. So finally, I'm granted an audience with the young private. And he spends the entire lunch speaking of you in your cinema. So, Fraulein Mimio, let's get down to business. Uh, uh, Dr. Gobels, I haven't informed her yet. Unless the girl's a simpleton, I'm sure she's figured it out by now. After all, she does operate a cinema. Uh, Francesca, tell her. What they're trying to tell you, Emmanuel, is Private Zola has spent the last hour at lunch trying to convince Monsieur Goebbels to abandon previous plans for Private Zola's film premiere and change the venue to your cinema. Ahem. <clears throat> what? I, I wanted to inform her. Oh, shit. I apologize, Private. Of course you did. What's the issue? The Private wanted to inform the Mademoiselle himself. Nonsense. Until I ask my questions, he has nothing to inform. Let the record state I have not agreed to a venue change. Duly noted. You have opera boxes? Oui. How many? Two. Would be better. Uh, how many seats in your auditorium? 350. <laughs> That's almost 400 less than the Ritz. Uh, but, but Dr. Gobels, that's not such a terrible thing. You, you said yourself you didn't want to indulge every two-faced French bourgeoisie uh, in taking up space, currying favor. With less seats, it makes the event more exclusive. Uh, you're not trying to fill the house. They're fighting for seats. Besides, to hell with the French. This is a German night, a German event, a German celebration. This night is for you, me, the German military, the high command, their friends and family. The only people who should be allowed in the room are people who will be moved by the exploits on the screen. I see your public speaking has improved. <laughs> Play. It appears I've created a monster. A strangely per persuasive monster. When the war's over, politics of it. <laughs> well, private. So I... So it is true I am inclined to indulge you anything. I must watch a film in this young lady's cinema before I can say yes or no. So, young lady, you are to close your cinema for a private screening tonight. What German films do you have? I... Ah, Landa, you're here! Shosana turns and sees the SS officer who murdered her family. Emmanuel, this is Colonel Hans Landa of the SS. He'll be running security for the premiere. The colonel gently takes her hand and kisses it before speaking in perfect French. Charmed, mademoiselle. Oh, and now I must get Reich Minister Goebbels to his next appointment. Slave driver. <laughs> French slave driver. <laughs> Goebbels and Francesca stand, but as Shasana goes to do the same, Blonda places a hand on her shoulder, keeping her seated. Actually, 
In my role as security chief for this joyous German occasion, I'm afraid I must have a word with Mademoiselle Mimieu. Uh, well, what sort of discussion? That sounded suspiciously like a private questioning the order of a colonel. Or am I just being sensitive? Oh, nothing could be further from the truth, Colonel. Your authority is beyond question, but your reputation precedes you. Should Mademoiselle Mimieu or myself be concerned? Hans, the boy means no harm. He's simply smitten. And he's correct. Your reputation does precede you. No need for concern, you two. As security chief, I simply need to have a chat with the possible new venue's property owner. Zola kisses Shosanna's hand before exiting with the others as Landa sits at the table. Have you tried the strudel here? No. It's not so terrible. So, how is it the young private and yourself came to be acquainted? She's about to answer when a waiter approaches. Ah, yes. Two strudels, one for myself and one for the mademoiselle. For me, a cup of espresso, and for the mademoiselle, a glass of milk. The waiter exits. So, mademoiselle, you were beginning to explain. Up until a couple of days ago, I had no knowledge of Private Zola or his exploits. To me, the private was simply just a patron of my cinema. We spoke a few times, but... Mademoiselle, let me interrupt you. This is a simple formality, no reason for you to feel anxious. The strudel arrives. The colonel takes one look at it and speaks to the waiter. I apologize. I forgot to order the cream. The waiter exits again. Shasana goes to take a bite, but Londa stops her. Ah, uh -uh. wait for the cream. So, Emmanuel, may I call you Emmanuel? Oui. So, Emmanuel, explain to me, how does it happen that a young lady such as yourself comes to own a cinema? The waiter returns and puts a scoop of whipped cream on each of the strudels. The colonel picks up his fork. After you. Verdict. Shasana, mouthful of strudel, nods. Like I said, not so terrible. So, you were explaining the origin of your cinema ownership. The cinema originally belonged to my aunt and uncle. What are their names? Uh, Jean-Pierre and Ada Mimio. Where are they now? My uncle was killed during the Blitzkrieg. Pity. Continue. Aunt Ada passed away from free bed last spring. Regrettable. It's come to my attention that you have a Negro in your employ. Is that true? Yes, he's a Frenchman. His name is Marcel. He worked with my aunt and uncle since they opened the cinema. He's the only other one who works with me. Doing what? Projectionist. Is he any good? The best. Hmm, actually, one could see where that might be a good trade for them. Can you operate the projectors? Of course I can. Hmm. Knowing the Reich Minister as I do, I'm quite positive he wouldn't want the success or failure of his illustrious evening dependent on the prowess of a Negro. So, if it comes to pass that we hold this event at your venue, talented no doubt as your Negro may be, you will operate the projectors. Is that acceptable? Oui. Cigarette? They're not French. They're German. Shosanna accepts and Landa lights it as well as one for himself. Hmm. I did have something else I wanted to ask you. But right now, for the life of me, I can't remember what it is. <laughs> oh well, must not have been important. Colonel Landa extinguishes his cigarette on the remaining cream from his strudel. He stands, and he kisses Shosanna's hand once again. Till tonight. And with that, he's gone. After a few silent moments, Shasan, Shasana nearly begins hyperventilating. That evening, the test screening of, at the cinema goes well. Gobel speaks as the group exits the auditorium and walks into the cinema lobby. I must say, I appreciate the modesty of the cinema. Your cinema has real respect. Almost church-like. Not to say we shouldn't spruce the place up a bit. Uh, maybe I'll go to the Louvre, pick up a few 
pick up a few Greek nudes and just scatter them around the lobby. <laughs> so, Emmanuel, how did you like Lucky Kids? I quite liked Lily and Harvey. Lily and Harvey? Never mention that name again in my presence. Shoshana sees Goebbels and the other Nazis out. When she returns, Marcel is standing at the top of the lobby staircase. Uh, hey, what the fuck are we supposed to do? It looks like we're supposed to have a Nazi premiere. Like I said, what the fuck are we supposed to do? Well, I need to talk to you about that. I'm confused. What are we talking about? Building the cinema with Nazis and burning it to the ground. I'm not talking about that. You are talking about that. No, we're talking about that right now. If we can keep this, pl if we can keep this place from burning down by ourselves, we can burn it down by ourselves. And we, Susanna, we could do that. And with Madame Mimio's 350 nitrate film print collection, we wouldn't need, we'd need explosives, would we? <laughs> you mean we wouldn't need any more explosives? At the time, 35 millimeter nitrate film was so flammable that you couldn't even bring a reel onto a streetcar because nitrate film burns three times faster than paper. Shoshana has a collection of over 350 nitrate film prints. I'm going to burn down the cinema on Nazi night. And if I'm going to burn down the cinema, which I am, we both know you're not going to let me do it by myself because you love me and I love you. And you're the only person on this earth I can trust. But that's not all we're going to do. Does the filmmaking equipment in the attic still work? I know the film camera does. How about the sound recorder? But well, actually, I recorded a new guitarist I met in a cafe last week. It works super. Uh, why do we need filmmaking equipment? Because Marcel, my sweet, we're going to make a film just for the Nazis. Chapter four, Operation Kino. Across the continent, in an English country estate, a young, handsome British lieutenant in dress brown is shown into a room. The officer is gobsmacked when he recognizes one of the two other men in the room. Sitting behind a piano, smoking his ever-present cigar, is the unmistakable bulk of Winston Churchill. The third man in the room, who is also in military regalia and holding a large folder, snaps the newcomer out of his stupor. Ahem. Lieutenant Highcock reporting, sir. General Ed Fenwick, at ease. Hickox, drink. Hickox. If you offered me a scotch and plain water, I could drink a scotch and plain water. That a boy, Lieutenant. Make it yourself like a good chap, will you? The bar's in the globe. Something for yourself, sir. Uh, whiskey, straight. No junk in it. The lieutenant moves over to the Columbus-style globe bar and busies himself while Fennec reads from his folder. It says here you speak German fluently. Like a Katzenjama kid. And your occupation before the war? I'm a film critic. Uh, list your accomplishments. Well, so, such as they are, I write reviews and articles for a publication called Films and Filmmakers, and I've had two books published. Impressive. Uh, well, don't be modest, Lieutenant. Uh, what are their titles? The first book was called Art of the Eyes, the Heart and the Mind, a study of German cinema in the 20s. And the second one was called 24 Frame Da Vinci. It's a subtextual film criticism of the study of the work of German director G.W. Pabst. He hands the general his whiskey. What should we drink to, sir? Well, um... Uh, down with Hitler. <laughs> All the way down, sir. They clink their glasses and drink. Are you familiar with German cinema under the Third Reich? Yes. Obviously, I haven't seen any of the films made in the past three years, but I am familiar with it. 
Explain it to me. Pardon, sir? Well, this little escapade of ours requires a knowledge of the German film industry under the Third Reich. Explain to me Ufa under Goebbels. Goebbels considers the films he's making to be the beginning of a new era in German cinema, an alternative to what he considers the Jewish-German intellectual cinema of the 20s and the Jewish-controlled dogma of Hollywood. How's he doing? Peacocks and Fennec turn. Churchill has finally spoken. Frightfully sorry, sir. Once again? You say he wants to take on the Jews at their own game compared to, say, Louis B. Mayer. How's he doing? Quite well, actually. Since Goebbels has taken over, film attendance has steadily risen in Germany over the last eight years. But Louis B. Mayer wouldn't be Goebbels' proper opposite number. I believe Goebbels sees himself closer to David O. Selznick. Churchill puffs on his cigar and nods. Brief him. Uh, Lieutenant Hecox. Uh, Le Lieutenant Hecox. At this point in time, I'd like to brief you on... Operation Kino. Uh, th three days from now, Joseph Goebbels is throwing a gala premiere of one of his new movies in Paris. Uh, what film, sir? The motion picture is called Nation's Pride. In attendance at this joyous Germanic occasion will be Goebbels, Goring, Bormann, and most of the German high command including all of the high-ranking officers of both the SS and the Gestapo, as well as luminaries of the Nazi propaganda film industry. The master race at play, aye? Basically, we have all of our rotten eggs in one basket. The objective of Operation Kino... blow up the basket. And like the snows of yesteryear... Gone from this earth. Surely good, sir. An American Secret Service outfit that lives deep beneath the enemy lines will be your assist. The Germans call them... The Bastards. The Bastards? Never heard of them. The whole point of the Secret Service, old boy, you're not hearing of them. But the Jerrys have heard of them because these Yanks have been them the devil. Will be dropped into France about 24 kilometers outside of Paris. The bastards will be waiting for you. First thing, you'll go to a little village called Nadine. In Nadine, there's a tavern called La Louisiane. There, you'll rendezvous with our double agent. She'll take it from there. She's the one who's going to get you into the premiere. It'll be you, her, and two German born members of the bastards. She's also made all the other arrangements you're going to need. How will I know her? I suspect that won't be too much trouble for you. Your contract... Your contact is Bridget von Hammersmark. Bridget von Hammersmark? The German movie star is working for England. <laughs> yes, for the last two years now. One could even say that Operation Kino was her... Brainchild? Indeed. Got the gist? I think so, sir. Paris when it sizzles. Two days later, in the village of Nadine, Aldo, dressed as a French civilian, and Hecox, dressed as a German SS captain, look out a small apartment window and see the stairway entrance to a small basement tavern with a sign that reads La Louisiana. You didn't say the goddamn rendezvous was in a fucking basement. I didn't know. You said it was in a tavern. It is a tavern. Yeah, in a basement. You know, fighting in a basement offers a lot of difficulties. Number one being, you're fighting in a fucking basement. Wilhelm Wicke is also there in a German SS lieutenant's uniform. What if we go in there? She's not even there. We wait. Don't worry. She's a British spy. She'll make the rendezvous. Donnie, Ulmer, and Utvich, also dressed in French civilian clothes, are in the room as well. In the back of the room, dressed in the gray uniform of an SS lieutenant, Hugo Stitlitz. 
Hugo Stiglitz sits by himself, sharpening a dagger. Stiglitz, right? That's right, sir. I hear you're pretty good with that. You know, we're not looking for trouble right now. We're simply making contact with our agent. Should be uneventful. However, on the off chance I'm wrong and things prove eventful, I need, need to know we can all remain calm. The renegade Jerry Sergeant stops sharpening his blade and looks up at the limey lieutenant. I don't look calm to you. Well, now you put it like that, I guess you do. Peacox moves over to Aldo. This Jerry of yours, Stiglitz, not exactly the, the loquacious type, is he? Is that the kind of man you need? Lo the loquacious type? Fair point, Lieutenant. So, y'all get in trouble in there. What are we supposed to do? Make bets on how it all comes out? If we get into trouble, we can handle it. But if trouble does happen, we need you to make damn sure no Germans, or French for that matter, escape from that basement. If Frau von Hammersmark's cover is compromised, the mission is kaput. Johnny chimes in. Yo, freaking of, speaking of uh, Frau von Hammersmark, whose idea was it for the death trap rendezvous? She chose the spot. Well, ain't that just dandy? Look, she's not a military strategist. She's just an actress. Yeah, don't gotta be Stonewall Jackson to know you don't want to fight in a basement. She wasn't picking a place to fight. She was picking a place isolated and without Germans. Inside the La Louisiane, a bunch of German soldiers are drinking and playing a game with a woman dressed to the nines in a chic 40s-style women's suit, complete with fedora. They have cards on their foreheads with names written on them. One of the soldiers, whose card says, Vinitu, speaks to the others. So, I'm male, I'm fictional, literary character from the past. I'm American, but that's controversial. No, it's, it, it's not controversial at all. The nationality of the author has nothing to do with the nationality of the character. The character is the character. Hamlet's not British, he's Danish. So, yes, this character was born in America. Mm, well then. The soldiers applaud the women's logic, and one of the flag... The soldiers applaud the woman's logic, and one of them flags the barmaid. Matilda! He points around the table. Schnapps? 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 Five, five schnapps, please. The barmaid smiles and nods as the other soldiers continue their game. If I had a wife, would she be called a squaw? Yes. He's, he's got it. Three more questions. Is my blood brother old Shatterhand? Yes. yes. Did Carl May write me? Yes. Yes. So, who are you? I am Winnetto, chief of the Apache. The table cheers as the three counterfeit German soldiers, Peacox, Wiki, and Stiglitz, walk down a spiral staircase and enter the basement tavern. One of the soldiers notices the officer's uniforms and abruptly jumps to his feet. Uh, uh, attention! The others go silent, stand, and salute their superior officers. Bridget smiles and waves to her allies. Hello, my lovelies. Take a seat. I will join you in moments. I'm just saying goodbye to my five new friends here. No, no hurry, Frau von Hammersmark. Uh, take your time. In enjoy yourself. We'll just be over here waving. The trio sits at an open table, and Bridget flags the bartender. Eric, my love, those are the friends I've been waiting for. Please treat them to anything they like. Von Hammersmark, your wish is my command. Officers, it would appear the drinks are on the frau line. What would you like? Whiskey. Two whiskeys. Three whiskeys. Three whiskeys. Very well. At the other table, Bridget stands. Well, I wish you a wonderful evening. Uh, same to you. Oh, uh, your card. Ah, yes, you're right. Let's see. Genghis Khan? Uh, I never would have gotten that. Of course you would have. 
She walks over and joins the masquerading German's table. The gentlemen rise and she greets each warmly with a cheek kiss, as if she knows them well. They all sit and begin talking quietly, naturally, in German. I thought this place was supposed to have more French than Germans. Yes, normally that's true. The sergeant over there's wife just had a baby and his commanding officer gave him and his mates the night off to celebrate. They should leave. No, we should stay. For one drink at least. I've been waiting for you in the bar. It would look strange if we left before we had a drink. She's right. Just be calm and en enjoy your whiskey. Matilda, come join us in the game. Take Frau Hammersmark's place. Matilda responds in French, her tone clearly indicating that she doesn't speak German, but Eric intervenes. You would love to play the game. I will translate and protect. Take your schnapps in hand, comrades. Before we go on playing, we will drink. We drink to our friend Wilhelm and his boy Maximilian. To Max! The soldiers raise their glasses and drink while Bridget continues whispering to her allies. There's been some new developments. The cinema venue has changed. Why? No one knows, but that should not be a real problem. The cinema, it has been changed so it's considerably smaller than the Ritz. So whatever explosive you brought for the Ritz should be doubly effective here. Now this next piece of information is colossal. Try not to overreact. Führer. Fräulein von Hammersmark. Wilhelm, the new father, who is clearly tipsy, has made his way over to their table. I was just thinking, could you sign an autograph to my son on his birthday? Of course, I'd love to, Wilhelm. Gentlemen, this is that handsome staff sergeant just became a father today. Congratulations. Thank you. Do you know the name of his progeny yet? Uh, I most certainly do, Fraulein. His name is Maximilian. Maximilian, wonderful name. Thank you, Lieutenant. Bridget signs a napkin and kisses it, leaving a big red lip print. Then she hands the treasured item to the young officer. Nothing for the best, but for, for little Maximilian. Thank you, Fraulein. Thank you. Max may not know who you are now, but he will. I will show him all your movies. He will grow up with your films and this napkin on his wall. I propose a toast to the greatest actress in Germany. There is no Dietrich, there is no Reifenstahl, only von Hammerschmack. The whole room toasts, and Wilhelm starts stumbling back to his table, as Bridget turns to her friends once again. Once again? But Wilhelm, drunk and starstruck, doubles back, and he sits beside Lieutenant Hecox. Uh, Frau Hammerschmack. What brings you to France? None of your business, Staff Sergeant. You might not have worn out your welcome with the Fraulein with your drunken boorish behavior, but you have worn out your welcome with me. Might I remind you, Sergeant, you're an enlisted man. This is an officer's table. I suggest you stop pestering the Fraulein and rejoin your table. I excuse me, Captain, but your accent is very unusual. Where are you from? Stiglitz grabs Wilhelm by the collar and pulls him close. You must be either completely drunk or mad to dare speak to a superior officer with such impertinence, Staff Sergeant. He turns to the soldiers at the other table. I'm making you and you responsible for him. I suggest you take hold of your friend or he'll spend Max's first birthday in jail for public drunkenness. Might I inquire? A German wearing an officer's uniform steps out from the alcove with a small table at the far end of the tavern. The bastards have never met him before, but it's Major Dieter Hellstrom, the officer who brought Shoshana to her lunch with Private Zoller and Dr. Goebbels only a few days earlier. Like our young, newly christened father here, I too have an acute ear for accents. And like him, I too find yours odd. From where do you hail, Captain? Major, this is highly... I wasn't speaking to you, Lieutenant Munich, or you either, Lieutenant Frankfurt. I was speaking to Captain... I don't know what. I was born in the village that rests in the shadow of Pispalu. The mountain. 
Yes, in that village we all speak like this. Have you seen the Riefenstahl film? Yes. Then you saw me? You remember the skiing torch scene? Yes. In that scene myself, my father, my sister, and my two brothers. My brother is so handsome, the director, Pabst, gave him a close-up. Yeah, Major, if my word means anything, I can vouch for everything the young captain has just said. He does hail from the bottom of Peace Plow, he was in the film, and his brother is far more handsome than he. The imposters laugh, and after a moment, so does the Gestapo Major. He turns to the sergeant. <laughs> you should rejoin your friends. The other soldiers drag Wilhelm back to their table, and Major Hellstrom, the highest-ranking officer in the room, even counting the imposters, smiles graciously to Hammer's mark. May I join you? By all means. Wonderful. He gives Stiglitz a firm pat on the shoulder, and the fake lieutenant gets the message. He moves down one seat so Hellstrom can sit between him and Hecox. So that's the source of your bizarre accent. That's extraordinary. So what are you doing here, Captain? Aside from having a drink with the lovely Fraulein. Well, that pleasure requires no explanation. I mean, in country. You're obviously not stationed in France, or I'd know who you are. You know every German in France? Worth knowing. <laughs> well, there lies the problem. We never claim to be worth knowing. <laughs> All levity aside, what are you doing in France? Attending Minister Goebbels' film premiere as the Fraulein's escort. Ah, you're the Fraulein's escort. Somebody has to carry her lighter. The captain is my date, but all three are my guests. We're old friends who go back a long time. <laughs> Actually, longer than an actress would care to admit. <laughs> well, in that case, let me raise a glass to the three luckiest men in the room. I'll drink to that. I must say, the game they're playing looks like a good bit of fun. I didn't join them because you're quite right, Captain. An officer shouldn't, should not fraternize with fraternize with enlisted men, but seeing as we're all officers here and a sophisticated lady friend of officers, what say we play the game? Yes, great. One game. Wunderbar. Soldiers, the cards, thank you. So, gentlemen, and mademoiselle, uh, <clears throat> The object of the game is to write the name of a famous person on your card. Real or fictitious, doesn't matter. For instance, you could write Confucius or Dr. Fu Manchu. Eric! More pens! And they must be famous, not Aunt Frida. When you finish writing, put the card face down on the table and move it to the person on your right. The person on your left will move their card in front of you. You pick up the card without looking at it, lick the back, and stick it on your forehead, like so. As Hellstrom explains, Hugo Stiglitz recalls being whipped by a Gestapo officer. A tap from Hellstrom breaks him out of his daydream. Right. The five players write a name, pass their cards, and put the cards on their foreheads. Stiglitz is Marco Polo. Hecox is Bridget Horney. Vicky is Brigitte Helm. Bridget is G.W. Pabst, and Hellstrom is King Kong. I'll start to give you an idea. Am I German? No. Am I an American? No. Wait a minute, he goes to... Obviously he wasn't born in America. So I visited America, I? Yes. Well, hmm. Was this visit fortuitous? <laughs> Not for you. My native land. Is it what one would call exotic? Yes. That could be either a reference to the jungle or the Orient. I'm going to let my first instinct take over and ask, am I from the jungle? Yes. Now, gentlemen, around this time you could ask whether you're real or fictitious. I, however, think that's too easy, so I won't ask that yet. Okay, my native land is the jungle. I visited America, but my visit was not fortuitous to me. But the implication is that it was to someone else. 
when I went from the jungle to America, did I go by boat? Yes. Did I go against my will? Yes. On this boat ride, was I in chains? Yes. When I arrived in America, was I displayed in chains? Yes. Am I the story of Negro in America? No. Well then, I must be King Kong. He throws the card on the table, and the others applaud. Bravo! Imp impressive! Now, since I answered correctly, you all need to finish your drinks. The three counterfeit Nazis knock back their whiskeys. Who's next? Major, I don't mean to be rude, but the four of us are very good friends, and we haven't seen each other in quite a while. So, Major, I'm afraid you are intruding. I beg to differ, Captain. It's only if Fraulein considers my presence an intrusion that I become an intruder. How about it, Fraulein von Hammerschmark? Am I intruding? Of course not. I didn't think so. It's simply the captain is immune to my charms. There is an uncomfortable silence. But after a moment, the major starts laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Of course I'm intruding. Allow me to refill your glass, gentlemen, and I will bid you and the Fraulein adieu. Eric has a bottle of 33-year-old whiskey from the Scottish Highlands. What do you say, gentlemen? You're most gracious, sir. Uh, Eric, the 33 and new glasses. You don't want to contaminate the 33 with the swill you were drinking. How many glasses? Five glasses. Uh, not me. I like scotch. Scotch doesn't like me. No, all right. I'll stay with the bubbly. Lieutenant Hecox holds up his right hand, and he raises his center three fingers for Eric. Three glasses. The bartender brings them their glasses, pours from the old bottle, and tops off Bridget's champagne. Major Hellstrom lifts up his beer stain and toasts. A thousand-year German Reich. A thousand-year Reich. They all drink, and the Gestapo major puts down his beer stein. I must say, I grow weary of these monkey shines. Did you hear that? That's the sound of my Volta pointed right at your testicles. Why do you have your Volta pointed at my testicles? Because you have just given yourself away, Captain. You're no more German than that Scotch. Eric sees this and quietly grabs a rifle hidden under the bar. Well, Major. Major. Shut up, slut. You were saying, Captain. I was saying that makes two of us. I've had a gun pointed at your ball since you sat down. Stiglitz draws his gun with a flourish and slams it between Hellstrom's legs. That makes three of us. And that's that, at this range, I'm a real Frederick Zola. Looks like we have a bit of a sticky situation here. What's going to happen, Major, is you're going to stand up and walk out that door with us. No, 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 no. I don't think so. I'm afraid you and I, we both know, Captain, no matter what happens to anyone else in this room, the two of us aren't going anywhere. Too bad about Sergeant Wilhelm and his friends. If any of you expect to live, you'll have to shoot them too. Looks like Little Max will grow up an orphan. How sad. Then, Major, I implore you, for the sake of those German troops, will you please leave with us? Lieutenant Hecox picks up his scotch and switches from German to English. Well, if this is it, old boy, I hope you don't mind if I go out speaking the kings. It turns out that Hellstrom is fluent in English as well. By all means, Captain. There's a special rung in hell reserved for people who waste good scotch. And seeing as I might be rapping on the door momentarily... <clears throat> ah, must say. Damn good stuff, sir. Now, about this pickle we find ourselves in. It would appear there's only one thing left for you to do. And what would that be? Stiglitz? 
Say off with us end to your Nazi balls. Gunfire rings out as Stiglet fires at point blank range. Hellstrom and Hecox fire as well. Blood flies and screams fill the tavern as the soldiers and barkeep draw their weapons and everyone exchanges fire. Stiglitz begins stabbing Hellstrom repeatedly until he is until he too is shot. When the gunfire stops, Sergeant Wilhelm is the only person standing, his machine gun in hand. We will now be taking a 10 minute intermission. Thank you. Welcome back. Before we begin, I would just like to say, as I don't have much of a chance as narrator, fuck Nazis. Thank you. After a few moments of silence, a bell rings as the tavern door at the top of the spiral staircase is opened. Wilhelm reflexively shoots, but the bullets merely bounce off the metal stairs. The young German soldier, the young German sergeant, yells in English. You, outside, who are you? British, American, what? We're Americans. What are you? I'm a German, you idiot. You speak English pretty good for a German. I agree. So let's talk. Okay. Talk. I, I'm a father. My baby was born today in Frankfurt. Five hours ago. His name is Max. We were in here drinking and celebrating. They're the ones that came in shooting and killing. It's not my fault. Okay, okay. It wasn't your fault. What's your name, soldier? Wilhelm. Now, is anybody on our side alive? No. I'm alive. Bridget sits up as best she can, no longer feigning death. Her leg has a bullet wound in it. Who's that? Is the girl on your side? Which girl? Who do you think? Von Hammersmark. Yep, she's ours. She okay? You despicable traitor. Wilhelm. She's been shot, but she's alive. Okay, Wilhelm. What'd you say we make us a deal? What's your name? Aldo. Okay, Wilhelm, here's my deal. You let me... One of my men come down there and take the girl away. No guns. No guns. Me. No guns. You. We take the girl and leave. It's a simple willy. You go your way, we go ours. And little Max gets to grow up playing catch with his daddy. So what'd you say, Willie? We got us a deal? Aldo? I'm here, Willie. I want to trust you, but... How can I? What choice you got, son? Okay, Aldo. I'm going to trust you. Come down. Aldo and Donnie slowly descend the spiral stairs. As they peek around the center column of the staircase, they show open hands, but see Wilhelm has his machine gun pointed at them. Aldo moves behind the pillar again. Hey, Willie, what's with the machine gun? I thought we had us a deal. We do have a deal. Now get the girl and go. Not so fast. We only got a deal if we trust each other. Mexican standoff ain't trust. You need guns on me for it to be a Mexican standoff. You got guns on us. You decide to shoot. We're dead. Up top, they got grenades. They drop them down here. You're dead. That's a Mexican standoff. And that was not the deal. No trust, no deal. Wilhelm, please. Think of Maximilian. All right. Aldo, fine. Just take that fucking traitor and get her out of my sight. Wilhelm places his gun on the bar, and a split second later has multiple bullets in his body. Bridget has shot him with Major Hellstrom's Le Walter. Later, Bridget puts her fist in her mouth to hold back a scream as an elderly doctor injects her with morphine. 
The Frenchman is still dressed in his nightgown, and the operating room is filled with kennels and barking dogs. They clearly found the nearest medical professional without regard for their area of expertise. Aldo stands around with the remaining members of the Bastards. Donnie Donowitz, Omar Omer, Smithson Utvich, and Gerald Hirschberg. Not so goddamn fast, Doc. Time to go play with those dogs. The veterinarian gets the message and moves aside. Donnie glares at Bridget threateningly and shoves the table of operating tools aside. Now, before we yank that slug out of you, you need to answer a few questions. A few questions about what? About I got three men dead back there, and why don't you try telling us what the fuck happened? The British officer blew his German act and the Gestapo major saw it. Before we get into who shot John, why did you invite my men to a rendezvous in a basement with a bunch of Nazis? I can see, since you didn't see what happened inside, the Nazis being there must look odd. Yeah, we got a word for that, kind of odd in English. It's called suspicious. He sinks his finger into her bullet wound. Everybody needs to calm down. You're letting your imagination get the better of you. He sinks his finger further. You meant the sergeant yourself, Philly. You remember him, don't you? Yeah, I remember him. His wife had a baby tonight. He had just become a father. His commanding officer gave him and his friends the night off to celebrate. Ow! The Germans being there was either a trap set by me or a tragic coincidence. It couldn't be both. Aldo pauses for a moment before pulling his finger out of the bullet hole. How'd the shooting start? Uh, th the Englishman gave him away, himself away. Now, how do you do that? He ordered three glasses. She holds up three fingers, pointer, middle, and ring. We order three glasses. She puts down her ring finger and extends her thumb. That's the German three. The other looks odd. Germans would and did notice it. Okay, let's pretend there were no Germans. Everything went exactly the way it was supposed to. What was the next step? Tuxedos. To get them into the premiere wearing military uniforms with all the military there would have been suicide. But the members of the German film industry, they wear tuxedos and fit in with everybody else. I arranged for a tailor to fit three tuxedos tonight. How do you intend to get them into the premises? Or into the premiere? Hand, hand me my purse. The tickets are right there. Lieutenant Hecox was going my, as my e escort. The other two were going as German ca a German cameraman and his assistant. Can you still get us in that premiere? Can you speak German better than your friends? No. Have I been shot? Yes. I don't see me tripping the light fantastic- tripping the light fantastic up a red carpet anytime soon. At least of all by tomorrow night. Uh, however, there's something you don't know. There's been two recent developments regarding Operation Kino. One, the venue has changed from the Ritz to a much smaller venue. Enormous changes at the last minute. That's not very Germanic. Why the hell are girls doing this stuff so damn peculiar? Probably has something to do with the second development. Which is? The Fuhrer is attending the premiere. Oh, fuck a duck! Aldo begins pacing about. What are you thinking? I'm thinking getting a whack at, at planting old Uncle Adolf makes this horse a damn different color. What is that supposed to mean? It means you're getting us into that premiere. I'm probably going to end up losing this leg. Bye-bye acting career, fun while lasted. How do you expect me to walk up a red carpet? The doggy dog's gonna dig that slug out of your yam. He's gonna wrap it up in a cast. You got a good How I Broke My Leg mountain climbing story. That's German, ain't it? Y'all love climbing mountains, don't you? I don't. I like smoking, drinking, and ordering in restaurants, but I see your point. We fill you up with morphine till it's coming out your ears, then just limp up your limp your little ass up that rose carpet. I know this is a silly question before I ask it, but can you Americans speak any other language other than English? Uh, Aldo and I both speak a little Italian. With an atrocious accent, no doubt. But that doesn't exactly kill us in the crib. Germans don't have a good ear for Italian. So you mumble Italian and brazen through it. Is that the plan? That's about it. That sounds good. Sounds like shit. 
But what else are we gonna do? Go home? No, it sounds good. If you don't blow it with that, I can get you in the building. Who does that? Who does what? Well, I speak the most Italian, so I'll be your escort. Donowitz speaks the second most, so he'll be your Italian cameraman. Omar, third most, so he'll be Donnie's assistant. I don't speak Italian. Like I said, third best. Just keep your fucking mouth shut. In fact, why don't you start practicing right now? Back in the basement tavern, Colonel Hans Landa, joined by his assistant and several other soldiers, stands among the many corpses strewn about. Landa moves over to one of the bodies and smiles. Ah, Hugo. You've moved up in the world. Look at you, Lieutenant First Class. And with your record of insubordination, truly remarkable. And that one's Wilhelm Wicki. He's an Austrian-born Jew who immigrated to the United States when things began turning sour for the Israelites. They're the two German-born members of the Bastards. They've been known to don German uniforms and ambush squads. But that doesn't look like this. This is odd. He surveys the room, and his eye catches something on the floor. One of Fräulein von Hammersmark's heeled dress shoes. He glances around again. The few female corpses are in plain clothing, and none have bare feet. It would appear somebody's missing. Somebody fashionable. He gestures to his assistant. Everybody out! The other soldiers quickly exit. As Landa prepares to leave as well, he spots something else. A napkin with writing and lipstick on it. The Max with love. Bridget von Hammersmark. Chapter 5. Revenge of the Giant Face. The day after the test screening for Goebbels, Marcel films Shoshana in a narrow hallway. She wears a simple black cloak and is lit from behind. Remember, on English, action! After the filming is done... But... How do we get it developed? Only a suicidal idiot like us would develop that footage. And suppose someone would develop the footage. How do we get a 35 millimeter print with a soundtrack? We find someone who can develop and process a 35 millimeter print with the soundtrack and we make them do it. Or we kill them. Later, Marcel roughs up an elderly man in a small film processing lab. Shoshana watches, pitiless. Bring that fucker over here. Put his head down on that table. You either do what the fuck we tell you, or I'll bury this axe in your collaborating skull. Marcel, do his wife and children know you? Oui. Then after we kill this dog for the Germans, we'll go and silence them. Soon enough, they have their film, and Shoshana splices it into real four, of nation's pride. The night of the premiere, Nazi banners are hung all around Shoshana's theater. Shoshana herself wears a stunning dress that is the same shade of crimson as the swastika cover fabric littering her home. She finishes her preparations by applying her makeup and putting a small pistol in her purse. When the pageantry of the evening is in full swing, she watches the Nazi military commanders, high-ranking party officials, and German celebrities mingling in the swastika-covered, Greek-nude, statue-peppered lobby. Among the many monsters gathered, she spots, she spots Hermann, Goring, Hermann Goring, the commander-in-chief of Germany's Air Force. Nearby, Goebbels speaks with Private Zoller and another gentleman. Yarnings, yeah, come on. Show the ring. Frederick, have a look at it. This is the highest artistic honor that I can give. Herr yeah, Doctor, I'm also feeling very honored. You deserve it, my dear Yarnings. But I believe after the premiere today, we have a new candidate. Shoshana approaches the group. Ah, Emmanuel! Uh, I'd like you to meet the greatest actor in the world, Emil Jennings. 
Mademoiselle, I'm pleased to meet you. You have a beautiful cinema. As they speak, Colonel Hans Landa, dressed in his finest SS uni dress uniform, stands at the top of the lobby staircase, looking down at the master race in all their finery. One of the waiters walks by with a champagne glass. Thank you, Herman. He continues to casually watch the festivities until something catches his eye. He makes his way down the staircase and approaches Bridget von Hammersmark, dressed to the nines, leg in a big white cast. Aldo, Donnie, and Omar flank her, the lieutenant in a white smoking jacket, and the other two in black tuxedos. Landa speaks in German. Fräulein von Hammersmark. Colonel Landa, it's been years, dashing as ever I see. What's happened to your lovely leg? A byproduct of kicking ass in the German cinema, no doubt. Save your flattery, you old dog. I know too many of your former conquests fall into that honeypot. Seriously, what happened? Uh, well, I tried my hand, foolishly, I might add, at uh, mountain climbing. <laughs> and this was the result. Mountain climbing? That's how you injured your leg? Mountain climbing? Believe it or not, yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 forgive me, Fraulein. I didn't mean to laugh at your misfortune. It's just mountain climbing? I'm curious, Fraulein. What could have ever compelled you to undertake such a foolhardy endeavor? Well, I shan't be doing it then. I, t I can tell you that. That cast looks as fresh as my old Uncle Gustav when we were climbing this mountain last night. Very good eye, Colonel. It happened yesterday morning. And where in Paris is this mountain? No, I'm just teasing you, Fraulein. You know me, I tease rough. So, who were your three handsome escorts? I'm afraid none of the, the three speak a word of German. They're friends of mine from Italy. Uh, this is a wonderful Italian st stuntman, Enzo Gor Gorlomi. She moves beside Aldo. A very talented cameraman, Antonio Margetti. Mar 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 Donnie pinches his fingers in a stereotypical Italian gesture. And Enzo's camera assistant, Dominic Di Coco. Omar does the same. Bridget shifts to Italian and addresses the bastards. Gentlemen, this is an old friend, Colonel Hans Landa of the SS. Bongiorno. Landa smiles widely as he turns to Aldo and shifts from German to flawless Italian. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure. The friends of our cherished are admired by all of us. This outright jewel of our culture are naturally going to be under my personal protection for the duration of their stay. It's not clear if any of the bastards understood what was just said to, him, said to them, but they smile and they nod. Grazie. Gorlomi? Am I saying it correctly? Uh, see, or correcto. Aldo wasn't lying. He speaks the language at least a bit. Gorla Lomi? Say it once for me, please. Gorlami. I'm sorry again. Gorlami. Once more. Gorlami. And you, what's your name again? Antonio Margariti. Again? Margariti. One more time, but really let me hear the music in it. Margariti. Margariti. And you? Dominic De Coco. Come again? Dominic De Coco. Bravo. Bravo. Bridget steps forward. Well, my two cameraman friends need to find their seat. Let me see your tickets. I suppose you getting a premiere ticket for your friends wouldn't be the most difficult for the star of your status. 0023 and 0024, that shouldn't be too difficult to find. Arrivederci. 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 Donnie and Omar exchange one last look with Aldo before entering the auditorium. Upstairs, Shoshana enters the projection room where Marcel is waiting. Oh la la, Daniel Dario! 
Shoshana walks in and peeks through the projector window, seeing that the auditorium is steadily filling up. I have to go down and socialize with these hung pigs. Let's go over it again. Uh, Rio one is on the first projector. Uh, Rio two is on the second. Uh, the third one is on the spool. And the fourth one is ready to go. Okay. The big sniper battle in the film begins around the middle of the third reel. Our film comes on in the fourth reel. Somewhere towards the end of the third reel, go down and lock the doors of the auditorium. Then take your place behind the screen and wait for my cue. Then burn it down. Downstairs, as Donnie and Omar find their seats, they spot, they spot Martin Borman. The rice light, the rice lighter, <clears throat> the rice lighter of the Nazi party. Second in command only to the Fuhrer. The two bastards sit in the middle of the row and fidget nervously, acutely aware of the ticking time bombs strapped to their legs. In the lobby, ushers inform the attendees that the screening is about to, be, about to begin. Bridget addresses Colonel Londa in German. We'll see you later, Colonel. Not so fast. A glass of champagne to toast nation's pride. The three clink their glasses and drink. My Fraulein, may I have a word with you in private? Certainly. Excuse us. Londa takes Bridget to Shoshana's office, leaving Aldo alone in the lobby with the ushers and guards as the remaining guests enter the auditorium. Have a seat, my Fraulein. Bridget sits, and Londa puts his coat on the chair. Mademoiselle Mimu allowed me to set up camp in her office for the time being. Londa sits on a small chair across from the movie star. Let me see your foot. I beg your pardon? Put your foot in my lap. Hans, you embarrass me. This is a Quentin Tarantino production. Londa points insistently to his knee, and Bridget nervously lifts her uninjured leg, placing her strappy dress shoe on it. The colonel delicately unfastens the shoe and removes it his movements distinctly surgical and not sensual. Could you please reach into the right pocket of my coat and give me what you find in there? The actress fishes around in the large pockets of the jacket draped over her chair until her hand touches something and she goes still. Londa gives her a small nod and she pulls her dress shoe that was left behind at La Louisiane. May I? She hands it over, and he carefully slips it onto her foot. A perfect fit. He switches to English. Voila. What's that American expression? If the shoe fits, you must wear it. <laughs> what, what now, Colonel? Hans leaps forward out of his seat and puts his hands around Bridget von Hammersmark's neck as he pins her to the ground, squeezing with all of his might. Bridget flails wildly in an attempt to force the colonel off of her, but the difference in their strength is significant. She isn't even able to scream as her esophagus is crushed. Soon enough, her flailing movements are reduced to trembling, and then to nothing. After catching his own breath, Londa stands and picks up the phone on Shoshana's desk. When someone picks up on the other end, he speaks in German. The guy in the white smoking jacket. In the lobby, Aldo is thrown to the ground by the Nazi ushers and his hands are cuffed behind his back and a black bag is slipped onto his head. They search him and quickly find the bomb attached to his ankle as well as his swastika carving knife. Fucking shithead fascist fuck. Thank you. Fucking fascist shithead. I can fuck you too, goddamn Nazi fun son of a bitch. Get your hands off me, fucking Bratmer smell, goddamn you. Get it. Aldo is dragged away, and one of the ushers hands the time bomb to Landa, who looks it over with amusement as he removes the timer. Hmm, clever. Landa quietly makes his way to an opera box where Gobels is waiting for the premiere to start. I have informed the Fuhrer that the audience has taken their seats. He should arrive any minute. Thank you, Hans. 
And then he goes outside, where Aldo is being held against a wall. Jerry banging Lindbergh smelling. Let go of him. Aldo goes silent. There is a moment of silence before Londa speaks in English. As Stanley said to Livingston, Lieutenant Aldo Rain, I presume? Hans Len. You've had a nice long run, Aldo. Alas, you're now in the hands of the SS. My hands, to be exact. And they've been waiting a long time to touch you. He pokes Aldo's face through the black bag that is still on his head. <laughs> Got you flinching. Aldo headbutts Londa, and several <laughs> guards restrain the American. The colonel is pained, but unbothered, as he waves to his men, who shove Aldo into the back of a truck still bound and bagged. As the truck arrives off the streets of Paris, Aldo realizes he's not alone. Yudovich? Say you, Lieutenant. Yep. Do you know what happened to Donnie? Omar? The woman? <sighs> no, I do not. The truck abruptly stops, and the two hood hooded prisoners are walked into a building where they are forced into chairs and their hoods are removed. Aldo and Yudovich now see that they are seated at a table in a rustic tavern. On the table is a telephone, bottle of Chianti, and three glasses. And on the opposite side of the table is Colonel Hans Landa. The only people in the building, apart from the three of them and the two guards standing behind them, is a single Nazi soldier who sits at an elaborate two-ray radio setup on the opposite side of the tavern. Tell me, Aldo, if I was sitting where you're sitting, would you show me mercy? Nope. What is that English expression with shoes and feet? Looks like the shoes on the other foot. I was just thinking that. Again, Quentin Tarantino. Londa's eyes move to the other two soldiers who brought Aldo and Yudovich inside. You may leave us, but stay alert outside. They silently exit. Hmm, so you're Aldo the Apache. So you're the Jew hunter. I'm a detective. A damn good detective. Finding people is my specialty, so naturally I worked for the Nazis finding people, and yes, some of them were Jews, but Jew hunter? It's just a name that's stuck. Well, you do have to admit, it is catchy. Do you control the nicknames your enemies bestow on you? Aldo the Apache and the Little Man? What do you mean, the Little Man? The German's nickname for you. The German's nickname for me is the Little Man? And as if to make my point, I'm a little surprised at how tall you were in real life. I mean, you're a little fellow, but not circus midget little like your reputation would suggest. Where's my men? Where's Bridget Von Hammer's mark? Well, let's just say she got what she deserved. And when you purchase friends like Bridget Von Hammer's mark, you get what you pay for. Now, as for your paisanos, Sergeant Donowitz and Private Omar. How do you know our names? Lieutenant Aldo. If you don't think I wouldn't interrogate every single one of your swastika mark survivors. <clears throat> We simply aren't operating on the level of mutual expect respect, I assumed. No, I guess not. Well, back to the whereabouts of your two Italian saboteurs. As of this moment, both Omar and Donowitz should be sitting in the very seats we left them in. 0023 and 0024, if my memory serves. Explosives still around their ankles, ready to explode. And your mission, some would call a terrorist plot, as of this moment, is still a go. That's a pretty, ex pretty exciting story. What's next? Lies on us. However, all I have to do is pick up this phone right here, inform the cinema, and your plans kaput. If they're still there. If they're still alive, that's one big if. There ain't no way you're going to take them boys without setting off them bombs. I have no doubt, and yes, some Germans will die, and yes, it will ruin the evening, and yes, Goebbels will be very, very, very mad at you for what you've done to his big night. But you won't get Hitler, and you won't get Goebbels, you won't get Goling, and you won't get Bormann. And you need all four to end the war. But 
if I don't pick up this phone right here, you may very well get all four. And if you get all four, you end the war tonight. The Nazi colonel picks up the bottle of Chianti, and he fills three glasses. So, gentlemen, let's discuss the prospect of ending the war tonight. So, the way I see it, since Hitler's death or possible rescue rests solely on my reaction, if I do nothing, it's as if I'm causing his death even more than yourselves. Wouldn't you agree? I guess so. How about you, Yudovich? I guess so, too. Gentlemen, I have no intention of killing Hitler and killing Goebbels and killing Goring and killing Bowman. Not, n not to mention winning the war single-handedly for the Allies, only to later find myself standing before a Jewish tribunal. If you want to win the war tonight, we have to make a deal. What kind of deal? A kind you wouldn't have the authority to make. However, I'm sure this mission of yours has a commanding officer. A general. I'm betting for... OSS would be my guess. Aldo's expression reveals that that was a good guess. Ooh, that's a bingo! Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. You just say bingo. Bingo! How fun! <clears throat> uh, but I digress. Where were we? Ah, make a deal. Over there is a very capable two-way radio, and sitting behind it is a more than capable radio operator named Herman. Get me someone on the other end of that radio with the power of the pen to authorize my... Let's call it the terms of my conditional surrender, if that tastes better going down. Yeah, where I'm from. Yeah, where is that exactly? Maynardville, Tennessee. I've done my share of bootlegging. Up there, if you engage in what the federal government calls illegal activity, but what we just call a man trying to make a living for his family selling moonshine liquor, it behooves oneself to keep his wits. Long story short, we hear a story too good to be true, it ain't. Sitting in your chair, I would probably say the same thing. And 999.999 .999 times out of a million, you would be correct. But in the pages of history, every once in a while, fate reaches out and extends its hand. What shall the history books read? Back at the premiere, Shoshana watches the movie from the booth. Private Zoller is seen on the screen cursing American soldiers as he shoots them from a bell tower. Zoller himself sits in the front row, looking uncharacteristically solemn, even pained. As the sound of record gunfire fills the theater, Donnie quietly exits the auditorium and goes to the second floor where he sees two armed guards standing outside an opera box. As he watches them, the, bo the door between them opens, and Adolf Hitler pokes out to ask if either of the guards has gum. Donnie returns to the auditorium, fetches Omar, and the two of them go upstairs again. In the projection room, Marcel gently puts his hand on Shoshana's so shoulders. It is time. I shall go and look the auditorium and take my place behind the screen. Shoshana and Marcel look lovingly into each other's eyes and kiss for several seconds. Shoshana holds back tears as Marcel exits. While Shoshana queues up the fourth film reel, Marcel quietly locks the auditorium doors and moves to the back of the house area behind the film screen. You can see the mirrored image of Frederick's sniper battle as the light from the projector passes through the screen and shines upon a mountain of nitrate film several feet tall and more than a dozen feet wide. Meanwhile, at the tavern, Londa has radio headphones held to his ear and a microphone in his hand. So when the military history of this night is written, it will, re it will be recorded that I was part of Operation Kino from the very beginning as a double agent. Anything I've done in my guise as an SS colonel was sanctioned by the OSS as a necessary evil to establish my cover with the Germans. 
and it was my placement of Lieutenant Rain's dynamite in Hitler and Goebbels' opera box that assured their demise. When Landa visited Goebbels earlier to inform him the Fuhrer was on his way, he slid the bomb that had been taken from Aldo under the only empty seat in the box. The timer reattached. By the way, that last part is actually true. I want my full military pension and benefits under my proper rank. I want to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for my invaluable assistance in the toppling of the Third Reich. In fact, I want all the members of Operation Kino to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. Hmm. Full citizenship for myself, but that goes without saying. And I would like the United States of America to purchase property for me on Nantucket Island as a reward for all the countless lives I've saved by bringing the tyranny of the National Socialist Party to a swifter-than-imagined end. Do you have all that, sir? I look forward to seeing you face-to-face -face as well, sir. Lieutenant Rain, right here. The colonel hands the headphones and microphone over. Yes, sir. He hears the voice of a general on the other end of the line. Colonel Landa will put you and Private Udovich in a truck as prisoners. Then he and his radio operator will get in the truck, drive to our lines. Upon crossing our lines, Colonel Landa and his man will surrender to you. You will then take over driving the truck and bring them straight to me for debriefing. Is that clear, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. Over and out. At the cinema, Goebbels and Hitler laugh joyously, as Private Zoller is shown slaying even more enemy soldiers. The real Zoller grimaces and whispers to his mentor. Uh, uh, Dr. Goebbels, excuse me. Could I go off for a moment? A uh, perfectly understandable, my boy. Uh, you go now, and we'll see you after the show. As Frederick slips out of the opera box, Shoshana starts the fourth film reel, and Marcel lights a cigarette backstage. Zoller makes his way to the projection room and knocks on the door. Shoshana nearly jumps at the unexpected sound. Who is it? Frederick. Shit. She opens the door just a little bit and looks at him with a displeased expression. He, as usual, is all smiles and charm. Are you the manager of this cinema? I want my money back. The actor in this movie stinks. What are you doing here? I came to visit you. Can't you see how busy I am? Then allow me to lend an assist. <sighs> Frederick, it's not funny. You can't be here. This is your premiere. You need to be out there with them. Uh, normally you'd be right. And for all the other films I do, I intend to endure evenings like tonight in proper spirit. However, the fact remains, this film is based on my military exploits. And in this case, my exploits consisted of killing many men. Consequently, the part of this film that's playing now, I don't like watching this part. I am so sorry, Frederick, but... So I thought I'd come up here and do what I do best. Annoy you. Uh, and from the look of your face, it would appear I haven't lost my touch. <laughs> Are you so used to the Nazis kissing your ass you've forgotten what the word no means? No, you can't be here. Now go away. Frederick abruptly shoves the door between him and Shoshana, forcing his way into the room. Frederick, you hurt me. Well, it's nice to know you can feel something, even if it's just physical pain. I'm not a man you say go away to. There's over 300 dead bodies in Italy that, if they could, would testify to that. After what I've done for you, you disrespect me at your peril. Lock the door. What? Lock the door. We don't have much time. N t time for what? <sighs> Forget it. No, no, no. Well, wait. You, you want me to lock the door? For the 57th time, yes. As Frederick turns to lock the door, Shoshana pulls the pistol out of her purse and shoots him three times in the back. He crashes hard into the door, then falls to the floor. Shoshana quickly looks out the projection booth window and sees the audience is still enjoying the film. The on-screen battle is loud and filled with recorded gunfire, and her shots either blended in or weren't heard at all. When she looks at Frederick again, his body moves a little, and he lets out a pained whimper. She moves to him and carefully turns him onto his back. As she does, she sees the gun in his hand just before it fires at her, knocking her back into a wall before she falls to the floor, 
her screams drowned out by the film. Shoshana Dreyfus and Frederick Zoller bleed out on mere feet away from each other as the projector continues playing the fourth reel of the film. Down the hall, Donnie and Oman, Donnie and Omar strategize in a bathroom. When I kill that guy, you got 30 feet to get to that guy. Can you do it? I have Donnie to. uses his knife to cut one of the bathroom towels while Omar grabs a champagne glass he hid in the bathroom trash basket earlier and he fills it with water. Then they each put on gloves with small guns mounted on the back and cover the machinery with the towel. Donnie steps out of the bathroom and strides confidently toward the opera box, looking like a waiter delivering a drink. He stops in front of one of the two guards posted at the door. Champagne? Before the guard can answer, Donnie moves his fist to the Nazi skull and fires his concealed weapon at point-blank range. As the other guard reels in shock, Omar sprints in and kills him from behind. In the span of four seconds, the room has gone from two guards to none. In the auditorium, the crowd cheers as the staged battle rages on. On screen, Private Zoller has a close-up as he looks down from his bell tower bird's nest and yells to the enemy troops below in English so they will understand it. Who wants to send a message to Germany? The projected image of Zoller's face close up, looking down on his enemies, abruptly changes to the face of Shoshana Dreyfus, looking down on hers. I have a message for Germany. For the first time since the premiere began, if only for a moment, the auditorium is completely silent. That you are all going to die. Enough! Stop it! Turn off the projector! And I want you to look deep into the face of the Jew who's going to do it. I don't know what's going on! That does not belong in my movie! Marcel. Burn it down. We, oui, Shoshana. Behind the screen, Marcel flicks his cigarette into the mountain of nitrate film. Shoshana's giant face laughs maniacally as an inferno abruptly forms, engulfing the screen, eng engulfing the screen and rapidly begins spreading across the theater. As the audience screams in horror and scrambles over each other toward the exits, Donnie and Omar burst into the opera box, machine guns blazing. They don't bother adjusting their aim because Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels were already approaching the door, preparing to flee, putting them right in their line of fire. Down below, the scrambling little Nazis reach the auditorium doors only to discover they are locked as the flames grow behind them. Omar proceeds to mow down Francesca and then begins firing into the crowd like shooting fish in a barrel. Beside him, Donnie unloads his entire magazine into the corpse of the former Fuhrer, his eyes alight with rage. Shoshana's continued laughter echoes over screams, her face projected onto the smoke filling the room in lieu of the screen. The cacophony is abruptly ended with a small ding and a loud boom as three time bombs detonate and the cinema is reduced to rubble. The next morning, a German truck quietly drives through the woods. Hans Landa sits in the passenger seat admiring Aldo's confiscated hunting knife. He looks over to Herman in the driver's seat as the vehicle is brought to a stop. These are the German lines, sir. Excellent, Herman. They help Aldo and Yudovich out of the back of the truck, both with their hands cuffed behind their backs. Herman, uncuff them. As he does so, Londa hands his loser an impressive-looking SS dagger to Aldo. I am officially surrendering myself over to you, Lieutenant Rain. We're your prisoners. What about my knife? Ah, of course. Thank you very much, Colonel. Yudovich? Cuff the colonel's hands behind his back. Oh, is that really necessary? Yudovich cuts, cuffs the colonel's hands behind his back. I'm a slave to appearances. Aldo smiles at Landa, and without breaking eye contact, 
he shoots Herman with his commanding officer's gun and hands his commanding officer's knife to Yudovich. Yeah, Berman. Are you mad? What have you done? I made a deal with your general for that man's life. Yeah, they made that deal, but they don't give a fuck about him. They need you. You'll be shot for this! Nah, I don't think so. More like I'll be chewed out. I've been chewed out before. You know, Yudovich and myself heard that deal you made with the brass. And the war tonight? I'd make that deal. How about you, Yudovich? You'd make that deal? I'd make that deal. I don't blame you. Damn good deal. And that pretty little nest you feathered for yourself? Well... If you're willing to barbecue the whole high command, I suppose that's worth a certain consideration. But I do have one question. When you go to your little place on Nantucket Island, I imagine you're going to take off that handsome-looking SS uniform of yours, ain't you? For the first time, Londa doesn't have a response. That's what I thought. Now, that I can't abide. How about you, you bitch? Can you abide it? Not one damn bit, sir. I mean, if I had it my way, you'd wear that goddamn uniform the rest of your pecker-sucking life. But I'm aware that ain't practical. I mean, at some point, you gotta have to take it off, so... I'm gonna give you a little something you can't take off. The screams of Colonel Hans Landa echo through the woods as he's held down, and a swastika is carved deep into his forehead. You know something, Yudovich? I think this one just might be my masterpiece. Thank you for listening to our radio drama presentation of Inglorious Bastards. Lieutenant Aldo Rain and Pierre Lapetit were played by Danny Hill. Colonel Hans Londa was played by Joel Gutman. Bridget von Hammersmark, Private Smithson Yudovich, Private Butts, Winston Churchill, and Charlotte were all played by Abby Brenner. Lieutenant Archie Hecox, Francesca Mondino, Sergeant Werner Rockman, Commander Babette, Herman, and Julie were all played by Hayes Converse. Private Fred... Private Frederick Zoller, Major Dieter Hellstrom, Sergeant Donnie Donowitz, Soldier, Corporal Wiki, and Winnetou were played by Casey English. Shoshana Dreyfus, Sergeant Wilhelm, Emil Johnnings, Private Omar Yulmer, and Private Gerald Hirschberg were played by Reach Streams. Joseph Goebbels, Ger- General Ed Fennick, Marcel, Sergeant Hugo Sticklitz, and Eric were played by J- Jason Amherst. Narration was done by me, Cam Griffin. Audio engineering was provided by John H. Baker. Script adaptation was done by Joel Gutman. We are pleased to announce that on Saturday, March 25th, we will be doing a radio drama presentation of the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie, Let's A Go. The performance will begin at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. For more nerdy content, please follow Digital Era Entertainment here on Twitch, And you can listen to our past radio drama performances on Digital Era Entertainment's YouTube channel. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you'll join us again next time. Goodbye. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us across social media for updates. Thanks for watching!